Great. Um, so some of you may already know Dr. Rich Bogart, but um, you may not know some of his really accomplishments. Um, Dr. Rich Bogart is a professor in the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology at UNC in Chapel Hill, co-director um, in UNC Therapeutics Development Center, and has been the medical director of the Clinical Research Unit at UNC. Dr. Reich Bogart um, has been involved with CF clinical research since 1995. He was the lead investigator for the development of inhaled casein um, and chaired the steering committee for the Pseudomonas eradication trial, uh, which actually influenced how this is currently treated today. Um, so it's really exciting. Um, over the last 13 years, uh, Dr. Reich Bogart has been a part of the national leadership of the CF Foundation's Therapeutic Development Network, which is um, known as the TDN. So in this role, he leads efforts to coordinate clinical trials between the TDN, um, the European Cystic Fibrosis Clinical Trials Network, and the Canadian Clinical Trials Network. Um, and he's currently chair of the TDN's um, research committee. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Roish Bogart this evening. And, um, so, Dr. Roy Bogart, take it away. Thanks so much, Ellen. That was a very, very kind introduction, and it was so nice uh, meeting everybody on the call today and um, and seeing some uh, wonderfully familiar faces. And some people will get credit for a clinic visit based on our um, our, our uh, talk today. So, anyway, so um, it's pretty exciting to talk about CF clinical research just about any time, but it seems like it gets more and more exciting every year. So I've pulled a lot of beautifully crafted slides from the North American CF conference for us to um, look at. And I've framed tonight's uh, discussion on these questions, um, starting off with what have we learned about Trikafta uh, one year after its approval, then move on to what's really happening in the drug development pipeline, focusing on genetic therapies and then some of the other drug development programs, and then wrapping up with you know, organs beside the lung. Uh, as a pulmonologist, I always think of the lungs first, but there's a lot of um, stuff that happens to the rest of the body in CF that we really are paying more and more attention to. So we'll start off with Trikafta. <clears throat> this is probably a graph that's somewhat familiar to most of us because it shows the dramatic increase in lung function measured as FEV1 um, when within two weeks of somebody starting trikafta therapy compared to placebo, and that over the 24 weeks, the people on placebo kind of met that um, tremendous improvement, which was you know far and away the most potent response to a therapy in CF that we'd ever seen. <clears throat> it was um, even more exciting because of the number of people, proportion of people with CF, uh, who are gonna benefit from uh, this breakthrough treatment. And it also set the bar uh, in this slide for how we think about, how do we compare any new treatment, uh, especially treatments that get at the underlying defect of CF in terms of how much improvement in lung function and how much of a movement toward normal in the sweat chloride uh, we would expect to see. So you can see here in purple uh, for Trikafta, about 14% uh, for those with one or two copies of the F508 mutation. This one here looks like it's lower, but you have to remember this was compared to people that were already on a modulator like uh, Ivacaftor or uh, Simdico. So these, this is really the very, very high and impressive bar that was set. And corresponding to that were these dramatic improvements in sweat chloride, which really reflected how physiologically this small molecule combination was able to normalize the transport of salt and water, not just in the lung, but in the sweat gland and very likely many other key organs. So at the end of last year, 90% um, of the population eligible to receive this highly effective therapy um, had an amazing drug. And that required one copy of F508 um, to see that effect. So not only was it important to you know, get the drug approved and out to all of our patients, um, we also structured with the support of the foundation what was called the PROMISE study, which was a way to look at many of the other organ systems that were really important to us as clinicians and people with CF 
um, so that beyond lung function, we were interested in what happened with infection and lung inflammation. How did it affect the digestive tract? What happened to uh, growth in some of the endocrine issues such as diabetes um, that really also are important uh, long-term? So the PROMISE study started giving us some information very, very quickly. This uh, slide shows on the left the proportion of people that had Pseudomonas aeruginosa in their respiratory cultures that a third of them within a short period of time became culture negative for Pseudomonas, which was again, an unexpected and dramatic um, improvement, which get reflected how effectively this drug was able to clear secretions that in the past would just stay fairly sta um, static in the lung. Uh, not the, the same effect was not really seen for Staph aureus in part because there's so many other reservoirs in the body, the throat, the nose, uh, and sinuses where staph uh, can persist. But the, the uh, response to clearing Pseudomonas was really um, wonderful. Um, one other aspect that has been reported out, and the PROMISE study is still ongoing because of the pandemic, um, we are continuing to gather information. So this is really a two-year study, but some of the information came out rather quickly. So this is a, a technique called uh, measuring mucociliary clearance in which the person inhales tiny radio labeled particles that then deposit on the surface of the bronchial tree. And then they sit in front of a camera that will then track the movement of the particles up and out of the uh, airways of the lung. And this showed that at baseline, um, it was a very um, slow rate of clearance over um, an hour and a half and that after treatment, the rate of clearance improved dramatically. Uh, and this was an effect that was seen uh, in Ivacaftor or Kaleidico and Trikaft, but actually could not be demonstrated with either or Cambi. Uh, and I don't, think, I don't think they saw it with Syndico either. The other thing that was being done in the study was to look at the actual respiratory secretions and what they found, since we know that hydration of the airways is really an important part of what is important for lung defense and is one of the things that breaks down in people with CF. The, the percent of solids in the secretions uh, at baseline were fairly high in this range. They, as a, on an average, dropped uh, as those airway secretions were more hydrated. Again, an effect uh, based on the um, impact of this uh, drug combination on the underlying defect. So these are the kind of things that are ongoing that we'll be getting more and more information on. And I'll talk a little bit more about it when I get to the GI part. The other thing that was really um, nice to see is that our ENT colleagues were very interested of the effect of Trikafta on um, sinus disease, which can be uh, more or less of a problem for individuals with CF. And on the left panel, you can see before and after treatment improvements in uh, sinus opacification, which is a measure of how much fluid uh, or infection is retained in the sinus cavities. And on the right is a graph showing an improvement in the score. The higher the score, the more symptoms and discomfort somebody's having because of sinus disease. You can see that again, in a short time, within a month, there was a drop in, in improvement and sustained improvement in sinus related symptoms. And I know that some of my patients um, in talking to them about their experience with Trikafta have also noted that same uh, kind of improvement. And it's a hard thing to measure. It's not like measuring lung function. So we really rely on either x-rays or uh, questionnaires to kind of quantify that level. Of okay. Um, so if we shift a little bit um, and think about the drug development pipeline and bring us up to the present, I like to think about it in is having two components. One is all the therapies that are focused on restoring CFTR function or treating the underlying defect. And this category pulls in the modulators like Trikafta and Kaleidico, um, but also is targeting things um, that are um, directed at the less common mutations or the more sophisticated therapies for a one-time cure such as gene replacement or gene editing therapy. And then the other half of the drug development pipeline is really therapies that are focused on inf um, influencing the complications of, of CF that affect um, lung, the GI tract, but really revolve around treating infection, 
moderating inflammation, enhancing mucus clearance, and addressing the needs for nutritional and endocrine therapies. So the pipeline, everybody's probably seen various forms of the pipeline, but initially I just wanted to talk about the left part here, the bars that are represented in purple, which are those therapies being developed to treat the underlying defect. Many of these are, of course, are already available and I've mentioned those. Here they are listed in terms of um, the, the type of mutations that they're effective for, like Trikafta, uh, and the age groups that are currently approved. So Trikafta, as most of you know, is approved for those 12 and older. We are anticipating that in the next few months, we're going to get approval for six to 11-year-old um, people with CF to get this therapy. Um, Kaleidico is now down to um, four months of age, uh, or can be down to two months of age and Simdaco to six years of age. So these are really have moved very, very quickly once the um, adolescent and adult studies have been completed. But the, the drugs um, from Vertex are not the only ones. Proteostasis, which has been merged with Humanity, another company, has a, another three drug combination that is a different type of profile that is moving through the second phase uh, studies. And Abby, a company that's been in CF space for a while, also has a three drug combination that is being um, evaluated. So um, these, these modulator drugs are continuing to undergo um, testing. It's become a little more challenging to do these kind of um, clinical trials in the context of the pandemic. I think one of the main um, topics that the foundation has been really focusing on is the pathway to a cure <laughs> which really has this very basic model where you have gene mutations in the CFTR gene, and then the three main approaches of either repairing the protein, which we've talked about through the use of modulators, or restoring the protein by actually putting in the template to make a normal protein, or going right into the gene by either editing the defects in the gene or putting in a, a normal gene copy. And we'll talk some about these. So this really, really focuses in on the 10% of our patients who do not currently have a highly effective modulator treatment. Um, and it's an important uh, target for the CF Foundation currently. Uh, so if you look at this part of the pipeline, uh, I mentioned most all of these uh, modulator therapies and the ones that are currently in development. Um, but this collection of um, treatments that are being developed really are focusing on the nonsense and rare CF mutations that are not responsive to any of the existing modulators that make up that 10%. There is one that is moving along pretty quickly. Um, there is a drug by ELOX, which uh, in the studies that before they move into um, human trials have been looking at various models that are affecting um, these different mutations where a full length protein is not made and is actually broken down. So you do not actually have a protein that you can modulate with any combination of uh, small molecules. So you essentially have to get the body to make a full length protein and then get it to the right location in the cell so it can actually be stimulated if that's necessary to transport chloride and hydrate the airways. So it's pretty exciting that this compound in this group is, is moving forward and has already shown that there is um, um, some efficacy in this profile of mutations. So that's good news. Um, in, for a very long time, uh, CF was really thought to be the real, a real great candidate for uh, gene therapy because back in 1989, we discovered the CFTR gene. Um, the problem was that it was one of the first genetic defects that everybody was trying to get gene therapy to work. And so uh, in the early 90s, a lot of trials were happening, but they weren't getting very far because there were so many barriers that people did not understand about how you package the gene, how you get it into the right cells, and how do you avoid stimulating the body's immune response to this vector that it really um, got moved to the side for a long time until we learned something more about those basic steps. And in the meanwhile, fortunately, because of this parallel development, we have this whole cluster of modulators that really have um, been a breakthrough in their own right. So 
the issues for really doing successful gene therapy are the gene is very large and you have to package this into some kind of container to get into the right cell types. Um, and you got to get it across the barriers in the lung. And, and most importantly, it's likely you're going to have to give it more than once. And as we know from the recent work around vaccines, you give a vaccine to stimulate the body's immune response. The body's very good at generating immune responses to foreign things. What would need to happen in CF gene therapy is that the body would accept this and you would not generate a huge immune response because if they saw that vector again, the, the body would uh, immediately attack it and would not let it get in. So to summarize, we have the CFTR mutation, we have the options of gene transfer, gene editing, and actually putting in RNA, which is the template to make normal protein. And these really cluster in that whole concept of a curative therapy uh, that would be a potential for everyone, perhaps even as a one-time cure. So to talk a little bit more about the, the treatments that are currently uh, moving along, um, using a package such as a virus um, can be really, really effective. But I mentioned that you really have to deal with the immu body's immune response to these virus factors because the body recognizes them and will um, block their uh, return. You're essentially going to be immunizing people to that virus vector unless you have modified it in a way that it becomes acceptable. The alternative to that is to package it into a, um, a globule of, of lipid or fat that forms a nice sphere and you can use that inner ch in chamber um, to package something like the messenger RNA that is much smaller than a whole gene that could then be used to make a, a, a copy of a, a full length functioning CFTR protein. Fortunately, these do not trigger immune response. Um, they require repeated dosing because it's not integrated into the body cells. So this would really have to be repeated dosing similar to what we do with pills. Just to review, most of you have thought about the CUF airways because we've all talked about how thick and thick, how thick and sticky the mucus secretions are, and that the lung has many, many branches. So that if you are going to be delivering a vector of gene therapy into the lung, you really have to go through all these layers of mucus across the cilia, across all the bonds between the cells lining the airway. And um, you have to use something that will accept it on the surface because these vectors can't get around to the bottom uh, or the base of the cells where there may be different receptors that might be actually more amenable to letting the, um, the gene therapy vector in. And I mentioned the immune response. I think that, um, you know, you again, as you think about these amazing coronavirus vaccines that have been developed in such a short time, it's a, breakthrough therapy, it's an mRNA um, uh, type of vaccine, and it's been developed like within a year's time. The problem is that that is given to people as an injection, it goes into the bloodstream, and it stimulates the body's immune response, which is exactly the opposite of what we want to do with CFG and therapy. So even though this has happened really quickly, and will be a great benefit to our population because of COVID-19, um, we have to do something very, very different. And that's why it's taken so long to make headway with gene therapy, to really understand how the body will handle these different vectors and how do we control the body's immune response in a careful way without immunosuppressing a person and making them susceptible to more infection. So this is a timeline in the past year of what's been happening funded by the CF Foundation. And the foundation realized a long time ago that if you um, bring the best scientists together with a magnet of sufficient funding to get them to collaborate and, and you know, make the breakthroughs that are necessary to move along a therapy, um, you end up with a successful program. But a lot of times it's going to mean a lot of meetings with a lot of companies and uh, eventually the best ideas will filter out because those ideas are reviewed critically by the best scientists uh, that the foundation has put together. But there's been $34 million already committed to these kind of programs. Uh, and that, that is a really uh, important magnet to pull in very, very serious cutting edge science. So this is a very quick summary of all the things that are going on 
with regard to CFTR restoration, the gene delivery, gene editing, which is another breakthrough. And I wasn't going to talk any more about it, but I think everybody's heard the word CRISPR. And uh, it, it is still uh, quite a ways off, at least for CF. Some other disease groups have, have undertaken some successful trials with this. The other thing that is important is to know that we need animal models to really be able to test some of these things before we ever are comfortable um, giving some of these agents to a person with CF. Um, so that a lot of this really depends on building the full package, not just the right vector or the gene sequence. You really need to have a, a really robust model to be able to test these to look at safety and effectiveness. Um, there are a number of companies that are making good progress. They're listed here, and you can read more about them at the CF Foundation website. Um, but they have different approaches of adeno-associated virus or a lengthy virus, which incorporates into that host cell DNA. Um, and these programs are doing so well that uh, the foundation is continuing to support them uh, substantially to make sure that they continue to move forward um, with both the um, development of the vector, but also the testing in animal models. Um, so the, the barriers, I've kind of alluded to them. We really need to deliver this DNA package of the gene that we have to know how long is it going to last, how are we going to get it to somebody, and what, what is the packaging we need. And then the other part of this too is we have to know which organs are going to be accepted, uh, acceptable for the vector to get into. Um, drugs like trich have to get to every cell in the body. But if we're giving somebody um, gene therapy inhaled, that means it's mainly going to go to the lung. And a lot of the other organs affected by CF uh, will not be uh, improved unless we can find something that is a vector that can be injected, carried by the bloodstream, and would get into the organs much the same way that trich is carried uh, in the bloodstream to, the org to all the cells that um, need it. I mentioned the importance of um, modifying the, the body's immune response. Um, people are actually carefully modifying uh, immunity to some of these uh, adeno-associated viruses uh, to make sure that uh, it's a, a good balance between allowing the virus in but not uh, making somebody um, immunosuppressed. And then a lot of really, really breakthrough work is going on. And I can't really describe this, but you can see this colorful diagram, which highlights how precisely some of these vectors can be uh, designed to target individual cell types in the airway to make sure that the gene therapy uh, agent gets right to the cell type that is um, uh, that transports the most chloride so that it is uh, correcting the right cells. So the future for these gene therapies is that all these therapies are going to be moving forward at the same time uh, rather than seeing how one does and then if that doesn't work we'll take another one they're really moving in parallel to find the most effective and safest uh, combination and uh, a type of gene therapy or uh, genetic therapy that can give them more than once because that's going to be required. I mentioned the animal models that are going to need to be uh, used to predict effectiveness before these are translated into the first trials in people with CF. And finally, the same kind of animal models to look at how do you modulate the immune response to make sure that if somebody enters in a trial that they are essentially immunized from ever getting any subsequent doses of the vaccine of the um, of the gene therapy and not not unintentionally vaccinating them against any future treatments the cf foundation website hopefully most of you have gone there under the research tab you can read more about restoring cftr function the treatments for nonsense and rare mutations, gene therapy for CF, and the uh, ways that gene delivery is being exam, um, evaluated. And finally, some of the breakthrough work around stem cells, which um, is also an exciting area that uh, holds promise. Um, and perhaps if we can find a way to treat stem cells and then deliver those, those cells will continue to reproduce and may um, eliminate the need for repeated courses of gene therapy since they will give rise to all the cells that are needed in the lung. So going back to the pipeline, on the far right are the categories of treatments that really manage the complications of CF. 
I wanted to focus a bit of time on these. So under anti-infectives, I think everybody is pretty familiar with the importance of effective antibiotics, both uh, IV, oral, and inhaled that <clears throat> have really um, brought us really great um, improvements in quality of life for um, people with CF. But there are a number that are um, under development that are not available yet. And some of these are really novel kinds of treatments. <clears throat> Um, the more antibiotics you get, the more likely you're going to have resistant organisms. And so one of the ways of getting around resistance in a bacteria is to use something that messes up the metabolism of uh, the bacteria. So gallium is similar to iron. And if you can deliver gallium uh, to the airways of a patient, you can actually get the bacteria to start breaking down because they can't reproduce and survive uh, without sufficient amount of iron. Another strategy is to actually use bacteriophages, which are viruses that are um, present throughout the environment and their main target are bacteria. And they really will latch onto the bacteria and break the bacteria down so that there've been amazing case reports to date of some patients who've had severe infections with CF and have been treated with bacteriophages that have gotten those infections under control. And so this is something that is being evaluated by um, investigators funded by the foundation as well as companies. Um, another uh, approach for somebody with more severe infection is actually inhaling a gas, nitric oxide, that can also uh, kill bacteria. Um, some bacteria form um, biofilms, which are a protective coating around the colonies that uh, they form in the lung. If you can break down the biofilm, it makes the antibiotics that we use penetrate into the uh, bacteria much more effectively. So some companies, Inspira, are working on a way to break down biofilms in a safe way. And finally, a lot of attention has been paid to um, mycobacterial infection. So there are a number of uh, groups that are looking at drugs used in TB that could be applicable to uh, mycobacterial infection as well. Foundation is putting a lot of effort into helping us understand how we uh, treat um, mycobacterium abscessus and mycobacterium avium infections, um, because these are um, a significant problem that for a long time uh, was, I, I think, unrecognized. If we shift to anti-inflammatory therapies uh, in the drug development pipeline, this is an area that has um, been very compelling. The problem is it's been extremely challenging to find agents that really can um, suppress the exaggerated and inflammatory response in people with CF um, without making them vulnerable to um, more severe infection. Um, at this point, high-dose ibuprofen was really the only therapy that was used, and that by itself was not even used that widely in the United States. There are a number of agents listed here that are uh, in various stages of development uh, to try to hit various parts of the immune response the body's immune response is incredibly complicated. That's true in the lung as well as other parts of the body. And trying to maybe control just one fraction of that is a way to reduce the response without making somebody vulnerable. So these are the groups that are working on this from a number of different angles, uh, whether they're targeting the actual inflammatory cells or some of the chemical mediators that communicate between the cells that potentially will fight infection but could also damage the lung. Mucosillary clearance, I'd mentioned the studies that were done that showed the potent effect of trikafta on clearing secretions, but drugs like pulmazyme, hypertonic saline have been used uh, clinically for a long time. A number of other approaches here are being used uh, to see if um, controlling the level of uh, water and salt on the airway surface can be managed. And this is especially important for um, the 10% or so of our patients who don't have a highly effective modulator. So we still need a way to clear secretions, manage infection, and control inflammation. So I'm going to shift gears, and we will have hopefully some time for questions. So there are a couple of things I wanted to highlight after leaving the pipeline. Um, a big question for any parents of young children and those especially who have had a new diagnosis of CF is, how soon will we get a modulator? Because we hear these modulators are really amazing. 
So Bonnie Ramsey, who founded the Therapeutics Development Network um, more than 20 years ago, has um, led the effort to set up a study called BEGIN in which um, children under the age of six who are gonna receive these highly effective modulators are gonna be tracked very, very carefully to look at all organ systems, um, lung, GI tract, growth, um, and then uh, lung infection, acquisition of new uh, bacteria. And so the reason this is not happening for those six to 11 is because we anticipate that the, the approval is around the corner. So this is a chance to actually track from very, very early age, the effects of um, how kids are doing at baseline and the impact that the highly effective modulator has in this very young age group, which is quite different um, from adults with CF who are taking the same drug. So we really need to look at all the organs that could be affected, but also uh, very carefully track the safety in the event that some of these potent drugs may have an effect that ha uh, on a growing child that was not anticipated or seen in somebody who was more physically mature. A big question that's come up is, you know, what is trikaftin or what are these drugs doing to the GI tract? And that was a hard thing to predict because we all grew, I guess I grew up knowing that most of our patients had lost pancreatic function by the time they were born. So we never expected that people will have potential for recovering pancreatic function. And so the graphs on the right show some of the data that's been collected in that um, there have been increasing number of young children who have been on Orcambi or Kaleidico, or, and we anticipate it's gonna be true for a trikafta, who will regain pancreatic function. And what is likely happening is similar to what's happening in the lung in that some of the healthy lung or healthy pancreatic tissue that's been plugged up with mucous secretions, secretions are cleared, the enzymes can be released, and instead of damaging and scarring the pancreas, they are now entering the digestive tract and um, doing their job of breaking down food rather than breaking down the pancreas. So this is a very exciting thing in that we are now looking at the possibility of reversibility a lot of, of a lot of things that we once thought could not be uh, improved. So this is why this, a study like BEGIN is so important um, as we continue to gather this information. The other thing that is speculated is that perhaps um, if we can do um, a lot of preservation of pancreatic function, we may reduce the incidence of CF-related diabetes in adults. And we know that this, um, the diabetes is a, a problem with increasing age of people with CF. So it is quite logical to assume if you can stop the scarring of the pancreas, you may preserve the islet cells that make insulin and therefore um, have a lower rate of diabetes in adulthood. So that's also um, a very exciting possibility. One thing that the foundation has done for a while is really try to get more and more gastroenterologists interested in, in being part of the CF care team and developing expertise because a lot of problems that um, we know about are related to the GI tract. It's not all about the lungs. So the first study that this group did was called the Galaxy Study. And the way the study rolled out and was enrolled reflects the high level of interest in answering a lot of questions related to the GI tract. We've never seen a study that from start to full enrollment was done in four months. Usually, you know, getting a study done in a year is amazing, but in four months, um, we had the study, the, the leaders of the study had the study enrolled and began um, evaluating the questionnaires that they were using. And the questionnaires were important because they reflected the current um, prevalence of GI symptoms. Uh, and the most common ones were bloating, abdominal distension, or a sense of fullness uh, after meals. And these are things that pulmonologists hear about, but we are not necessarily the best in uh, terms of understanding the best next step, uh, other than making small tweaks in pancreatic enzymes or considering anti-acid therapy. Um, I think having GI colleagues actively involved in this is really going to continue to improve outcomes. So this is all, the entire GI perspective is rolled into the PROMISE study that I mentioned earlier, looking at pancreatic function, looking at the, um, the bacterial load in the gut, um, growth, um, inf actually intestinal inflammation, effects on the liver, um, 
and actually the motility of the GI tract, which may um, be responsible for a number of the things which are um, leading to symptoms that um, at least half of our patients find bothersome. Um, the one other thing that um, to me is really exciting is that um, we've discovered that women on Trikafta um, are much more fertile than they or um, maybe the sponsors of the drug studies ever imagined. So this graph shows the rising number of pregnancies um, over the last, um, I guess it's not evenly divided, but um, the, clearly there's an increase in the number of pregnancies reported. Uh, and this is likely to continue to get even greater. Uh, and it's very exciting because um, in the past, uh, the decisions to have a child, if you had CF uh, as a mother, uh, really was very complicated because of health. And um, would that make a, um, would that actually cause a decline in, in someone's status if they decided to have um, a child and get pregnant? So there is a study that's about to begin in 2021 called the Mayflower Study that is being led by an exceptional team of women um, that is really beginning to gather, going to gather information in a very careful, systematic way to look at maternal health, obstetrical outcomes, the outcomes on the baby, and also understand how do these modulator drugs actually work uh, or how are they metabolized and, and who gets um, exposed? Because we've already known that you can measure uh, levels of these modulators in um, not just maternal blood, but in uh, cord blood, so it's crossing the placenta in uh, breast milk. Um, and so we really need to understand how best to advise our patients um, in issues around pregnancy. Do you stay on a modulator? Do you have to come off a modulator? And what are the pros and cons of each of those things? And the only way to really provide adequate guidance is to study it. Um, I think we are all aware of the fact that for a long time, um, we probably have not paid very much attention to the fact that there is great diversity, not just in the country, but there is great diversity within the CF community. And that um, among um, Hispanic, Black, Asian, and Native American populations, um, a very high percentage of those people who have CF do not have the F508 deletion mutation. So they disproportionately are among that 10% group that currently doesn't have a highly effective modulator option. Uh, and I think that this, is, may, this makes the push to actually look at um, effective therapies um, beyond what we now have even more important um, given all of the issues around um, health disparities that affect uh, minority populations. And this is a, a, a major focus, not just for the foundation and the CF community, but also for the CF research community. Finally, all this is really possible because the foundation has really opened its arms to get as much information from the CF community on all aspects of everything that's happening. You know, what are the research priorities? What are the clinical care priorities? And what we're doing tonight is I think an example of how it really is a dialogue and we are continuing to make progress but only we can only do it together. Uh, so I think that for any of us that have the opportunity to support uh, or participate in community voice, it is so, so very important. Um, and the last thing I wanted to end with was um, at the beginning in the introduction you mentioned the networks. Because we have a lot of work to do and we have partnerships in uh, CF communities in Europe and Canada, hopefully we're gonna partner with Australia and New Zealand um, when we are looking to get breakthrough therapies for the last 10%, we really will need a global approach to get um, clear answers as to what therapies are really uh, effective. Um, and as more and more people are on highly effective modulators, it may become more difficult for them because of busy families, careers, school, to take time off to be in a, a, a research study. So. Um, getting the research done will remain important, but we have to, again, broaden our circle to um, make research 
opportunities open to as many as possible to get the answers we need because there's a lot of work to do. And based on how far we've come, uh, I can only be tremendously optimistic about how far we're going to get together. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, if there's time. Yes, I, there's definitely time. If anyone has a question, you can jump in. Thank you. That was um, very informative and thorough and exciting. So if anyone has a question, go ahead. You can um, turn on, turn yourself off mute and go ahead and ask. Or I guess there's always the chat option too. I can try to monitor that. So whatever way you're most yeah. comfortable. Hi, sorry, Jennifer. Uh, Julie, can you just talk a little bit more about the ELXO2, that new um, drug or whatever it is that's coming out? Um, you touched on that, but it was just fairly quickly. Yes. So. Well, it's, um, you know, the, the basic issue for um, somebody who has a stock mutation or sometimes called nonsense mutation is that the protein um, isn't full length. For many mutations, there's a, a variation in the way the protein is organized, and so it has the wrong shape or uh, doesn't get to the surface. Here, the protein is too short and essentially goes into the wastebasket of the cell. And so the, the um, strategies have been to try to find some way to jump over that stop signal that makes the short protein. And there are a lot of different approaches people have tried. One of the earliest ones um, did not actually pan out. So it's not an easy problem to, to solve. And the fact that they have these really good cell models to test these, which is really the way that um, uh, Ivacaft or Kaleidico and uh, or Cambi and Tricafta were evaluated. They initially were screened with very, uh, very rigorously through a cell culture model to say, yeah, this looks like a candidate drug and then they would expand it to further testing. So this is a similar system um, looking at a class of mutations that doesn't make a full length protein. And so uh, in that model, they can demonstrate that they have made a full length protein that is then also functional in transporting uh, chloride the way it should. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Hi, this is Laura. I just wondered is there more work being done on CF and colon cancer? Do you know at this point if Trikafta helps that at all? Yeah, and there are so many really pressing questions about Trikafta, and most of them are going to require really a long period of observation. Um, there was a lot of um, attention paid to the fact that there appeared to be a higher rate of colon cancer among people with CF. Um, and then we realized that we had to do more screening uh, and colonoscopies, and then the prep for the colonoscopies itself became an important focus because that may not be as easy as it is um, for somebody that doesn't have CF. So I think that in the, in the guidelines now, there really is a plan or part of the care plan is to make sure that colonoscopies are being done on a regular basis. And, and so within that group that is on Trikafta, we'll have some sense going forward if that is actually uh, gonna hold up or if it actually is, is um, protective. It's a really important question. I think it's the kind of study that needs to be done over a long period of time. And unfortunately we'll have many people that could potentially participate and they'll track that in the CF Foundation Registry. Thank you. There was a question just put in the chat. Um, for those eligible for Trikafta, do you foresee the best treatment for them in the future to be improved CFTR modulators or another method like gene editing? Um, yeah, it's. Um, I think that gene editing is far enough away that um, I'm really grateful that we have Trikafta because you know oftentimes you know I have the question of how soon will we start doing some of these you know, uh, gene editing trials. And I think that's still a ways off. I think that like putting in a, um, a normal copy of the CF gene, um, packaging the uh, CRISPR to get into the right cells to fix the 
defective gene um, segment, it, it's going to be a, a packaging and a, a delivery problem. And so even though there's a tremendous amount of work at, going on, I think for now, I think most people that have Trikafta available um, are likely to kind of focus on that <clears throat> as being their mainstay and then figuring out, um, and, and this is something that's being tested through the Simplify study, what other treatments do they still need to use? Um, they still need to use hypertonic saline because it's doing a similar thing, um, but longer. And uh, how about pulmozyme? Is that still necessary? Um, so I think that answering those kind of questions will be a higher priority in order to simplify the treatment burden uh, because those inhaled therapies take a lot of time. Plus there's the added time of cleaning and making sure you don't inadvertently infect yourself with an aerosol of bacteria. And isn't it, aren't therapies, it, it's different now, right? If you try to take Trikafta, they're still having you do your same therapies, but you may not have to for forever. Right, right. And, and it's, um, <clears throat> it's a difficult question because um, it is hard for me to give my patients advice about stopping hypertonic saline or pulmozyme. Um, it's easy to make that decision if they don't tolerate it anymore because it just causes them to have bronchospasm while they're on um, uh, a modulator. But um, I think that someone may actually have an area of the lung that is more affected and that area still will benefit from, um, let's say, pulmozyme in clearing secretions, um, whereas the rest of the lung will continue to benefit from Trikafta. So those kind of... Um, I guess fine tuning or tailoring therapy questions are gonna be very important. It'll be, I think, better for us to make recommendations as clinicians once we have some data about what happens when you stop one of these treatments for somebody who's stable. Um, do they maintain their lung function or do they have you know, a worsening in the lung function or do they have an exacerbation? And actually studying that is, is probably the best way, the safest way, uh, rather than everybody throwing off their meds and saying, okay, we're done. You know, I'm just going to take my pills and, and that's it. So I'm sure some people have done that. Uh, it's probably not the best choice. Um, so I, I think more, inf more information is better in making decisions like that. I did have another question. So, so my daughter who couldn't stay on Trikafta I'm hoping that Translate Bio, their mRNA yes. inhaled might work. Do you think that that one, well, that would work for everybody, 100%. So yep, absolutely. Do you think for people who maybe can't do the Trikafta, that would be an option? Uh, yep, I think so. I think so. And it's, you know, it, and I, I don't know what the numbers are offhand of, what percentage of our population eligible for Trikafta actually doesn't tolerate it. But um, I think you bring up an excellent point in that we have to make sure that that percentage, that, that small group is included in the priority for finding, you know, what is the next best thing uh, for someone that can not tolerate it. But I think the Translate Bio approach is really excellent. Are there any other questions? Oh, I guess. Oh, hold on. I just have one more quick one. <laughs> yeah. George, you said one third of people on Trikafta are now um, culture negative for Pseudomonas. Um, so was that just a preliminary finding? Do you expect that number to go up or go down? Or do you think that's where we are? We're at one third. Yeah, I think they're um, in the promise study that you know, was the way that data was generated, there will continue to be uh, um, cultures collected at regular intervals over a two-year period or maybe longer. Uh, and that'll give us a sense of, you know, um, are some people clearing pseudomonas, uh, but taking them longer than that short interval that we had data for that right. I showed on that graph. Um, 
The biggest problem, though, is that if you get on Trikafta, you have less cough, less sputum production. So therefore, getting good samples from lower airway secretions becomes increasingly challenging because the drug is so beneficial. So um, that's going to make the interpretation of the data a bit more challenging. Um, and, and the investigators running that study are going to have to figure out how they're going to end up reporting it. Um, I think that sputum induction is a way of, you know, getting around the fact that somebody may not spontaneously bring up sputum in the morning or in clinic, uh, so that that may be one way around it. Sputum induction is hard to do in during the pandemic because it's an aerosol generating procedure. In some places, you can't do that because it's considered to be too high a risk. So, okay. but it's an excellent question. Right, thanks. Uh, I was interested in your uh, discussion of the, the damage to the pancreas. And if I understood you correctly, you said that unless it was addressed uh, uh, either in utero or, or as an infant, that the damage was permanent and could not be uh, reversed. Is that true? Well, we used to think that if somebody was born and had poor pancreatic function, um, that it's unlikely that that would ever get better. And so I, I think that it was sort of surprising uh, when uh, infants that had a low, what we measure clinically as a fecal elastase, uh, they were on therapy for a period of time, it was rechecked and actually the level went up. Um, so there is some reversibility in the pancreatic damage that may be present at, um, at birth, um, but only if you can institute treatment early enough. Uh, so I think it's unlikely that somebody who's 21 and gets on Trikafta will have recovery of pancreatic function. Other parts of the digestive tract, you know, liver, the intestinal tract, may benefit, but it's less likely that the pancreas is going to have the same kind of um, recovery that has been seen in the younger patients. Well, do any of the existing um, therapies either slow or um, terminate additional damage? In the pancreas? Yes. Um, so far, the, the yes. only ones that we have found that have an effect are the high, highly effective modulators. So Kaleidico, Orcambi, probably Simdico, and, and probably Trikafta. Thank you. Well, you've been a great audience. I, <laughs> I covered a lot of territory as I usually do, probably more than you wanted to see, but I, um, I think it, it hopefully gave some a chance to hear what was presented at the North American meeting if they couldn't you know, observe. And um, as always, I think any of our CF clinicians and care team members welcome all your questions if things come up. Um, you can always forward an email through whomever you know, uh, and I can give you my best answer. Or find somebody who can. Thank you very much for presenting this evening, Dr. Richberger.